Operations Squadron in Vietnam, 335th Tech Fighter Squadron in uh, Seymour Johnson, North Carolina. So I, I was around, get busy with the Air Force. They kept me busy. Uh, my uh, dad uh, spent his whole life working for Transworld Airlines, his whole career. And there's one airplane on the other in the other hangar that my mother worked on when she was Rosie the Riveter. Huh. So we're kind of an, air, we're an aviation family. Um, if you have any questions, again, uh, hold up a hand. I'll try to answer your question. Yeah. And, and your name, uh, sir, was? Hey, what? Your name, yes. sir? Dennis Smurl. Dennis Smurl. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's get started. First airplane I want you to take a quick look at is the Douglas F3D Sky Knight. And this, I like puns. I hope you do, too. But when they call it Sky Knight, they spell it K-N-I-G-H-T, like a knight. Um, in the army. But the reason they call it the Sky Knight is that it flew at night. This is a night fighter. Up front, notice that that front of the airplane's got that big dome on it. That's what's called a ray dome. And there was a great big radar set in that aircraft. On this side of the aircraft, you had a pilot. And on the other side of the aircraft, you had a radar intercept officer. This aircraft, this type of aircraft, could shoot down aircraft that were a lot faster than it because at night, particularly when you had our bombers only going 300 miles an hour, enemy fighters would come up, would have to slow down to engage our bombers, and these guys painted black would be waiting with their radar and they'd come up behind the enemy fighters and shoot them down. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> This is a loner. We don't own this airplane. That's why it's roped off, so please don't touch it. This airplane flew in here, and when the owner decides to go to an air show or wherever, we will open the hangar doors, and he will take it out, and he will fly there. Okay, every part they can get off this airplane and put brand new paint on everything. If everything that was bent or dinged was replaced, so it's like a brand new airplane. If you had one coming off the factory in Los Angeles in 1944, it would be that airplane. Who owns the aircraft? Yeah, I was going to say, somebody that's very rich. Well, yeah. He lived here, here in... He lives in Lawrence. Lawrence. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, he's, a, he's an entrepreneur that's over there in Lawrence. And, and this airplane is estimated to be worth $1.8 million. Ooh. Okay, just that's setting $1.8 million. Yeah. Oh, there's one's on the top. one? Those actually are again safe. This one right here? Yeah. Yeah, this airplane really looked bad. So we cleaned this airplane up, sanded the airplane all the way down to the metal, primered it, and had a professional painter paint it. Uh, this is an F 84F Thunderstreak. This aircraft is good for about 670 miles an hour, and the aircraft was used mainly by the United States Air Force in Europe carrying nuclear weapons. Oh. Now, my, my, my uh, attachment to this airplane is significant because when I was about the age of these guys, my mom was building these airplanes. And so on weekends, every now and then, she'd sneak me into the factory. Where was that at? Kansas City. It's where they oh. built the Malibus. The, oh, was that right? The General Motors plant. I'll be yeah. darned. Yeah. So uh, this airplane has been really close to me all my life. Okay, this airplane to the wind This is a carrier plane. This is an F9. Yeah. This airplane was used in Korea for destroying hydroelectric dams. On the wing, you see three projections. Those are pylons. And they would put rockets on there. And the rockets were called five, they were five inch HVAR, high velocity artillery rockets. Those rockets carry the same explosive power as a gun on a destroyer. Ooh. So if a destroyer pulls up and turns like this and shoots at you, it's called a broadside. And so six guns shoot those big shells at you. This airplane had three on each side. Six guns, big shells. They literally took concrete dams and destroyed them so that you couldn't, the North Koreans could not make hydroelectric power. Once that happened, the war was over. Because they couldn't have no communication, they had no electricity, they had nothing. So 
Stop the warning. This airplane is much as anything. Stop the warning. On the uh, internet, its pilot showed up. <laughs> yeah. This is a Russian airplane. This is the MiG-15 from, from the Korean War. Uh, this airplane was a surprise. Our intelligence people did not know that the Russians had this airplane and certainly did not know that the Russians were giving these airplanes to the North Koreans. We were flying this airplane because we were pretty doggone happy with it at about 580 miles an hour. This airplane came out of the blue at 670 miles an hour. Ooh. Okay. Not good. Not good. <laughs> you had to outwit the guy because he had speed on you. He had bigger guns. Okay. So the MiG-15 was, again, uh, it, that was our nemesis during the Korean War. Uh, flown by Russian pilots, it was very, very devastating. Flown by North Korean pilots, we learned one thing, don't let North Koreans fly your airplanes. They're not very good. <laughs> I'm here, but I'll tell you what, everybody thinks I like this story. Of all the aircraft in the inventory, Air Force and Navy, this is the only type that ever shot itself down. <laughs> okay? They were testing one of these. And they went up very high, about 10 miles up, and they shot all the bullets out of the gun. Then the pilot went into a steep dive to see how fast the airplane would go. Guess what? He ran was faster than the bullets. <laughs> oh, yeah, he did. He caught up with his bullets. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, luckily, he was out over the landing, out, out, out from New Jersey. He, the engine's failing, smoke's coming out. The guy's really worried. He looks down, and there's a Coast Guard cutter. Wow. If I'm lying, I'm dying. He takes about two turns around the cutter, calls him, and says, Man, I've you know, lost this airplane. Said, Punch out. He hardly even got wet. He kind of hit the water, and they pulled him out. <laughs> yeah. But that's what happened with that type of airplane. It's the only time you ever shoot yourself down. We were learning a lot about airplanes. There's a lot, a lot of what we call tube frame work in this airplane. And so the engine was bolted solid to the tube frame, and so was your seat. And so after about an hour in the air, your bottom and your hand would be completely numb because of the vibration, the constant vibration of the engine. So the company called this the Valiant, like Prince Valiant. The guys that flew it called it the vibrator. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, like I say, it was a really, really good airplane for its time. And if you go to air shows, you'll see a lot. What's that, what's that little one? We're going to come around in just a second, guys. It's not really an airplane, so I'll leave This is an F-105D Thunder Chief. You're talking about this one. Yeah. And if you want to have that kind of <gasps> moment, all you have to do is think about this airplane flying through the air at 1,300 miles an hour. Oh. Wow. That's the speed of this airplane, 1,300 miles We're an looking hour. at that. Okay, now, here's another thought for you. This is a gas tank. There's one on the other side. If you, have, if you are an ordinary family, you've got yourself a minivan, mom takes you to soccer practice, dad goes to work in his pickup truck, there's about two years worth of gas for you right there in that tank for your family. On the other side of the airplane is another tank. And in the middle of the airplane are internal tanks that actually carry more than these tanks. That's how much gasoline this thing carried. Uh, it was used in Vietnam and was used pretty effectively in Vietnam. So how long, how long would all that gas last if you flew this airplane? All your tanks were full and you took off, how long would it go? If you were loaded all the way out to the wingtip with bombs, you're going to hit the tanker in, within one hour. That's an hour's worth of gas, all yep. those tanks? Yeah, if you don't hit that tanker in one hour, you're in deep, deep trouble. Or if you go up and anything happens in terms of your uh, receiving mechanism that you don't, you can't take on fuel, Yeah. you're in deep trouble. Ooh. Because you may not have enough gas to get to the nearest airfield. You may have to, you may have to check. Whoa. Okay. So you went up. Uh, if you came out of like Tockley, you'd go up. You'd hit a uh, tanker. It had a KC-135 over Laos. 
then you turn and go north and, and west, or north and east, and go on into Vietnam. Drop your bombs in North Vietnam, come out, the tanker would have chased you, and would have gone all the way to the very edge of Laos. And it would be turning, and it would be ready to catch you on the way back so that you could catch, and then there'd be other tankers in the racetrack. So, so for one sortie, it would take six years worth of gas for an ordinary car. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I want to show you the gun, or actually the gun in place, and I'll tell you a little bit about the gun. Okay. okay. What we have is the front of the gun. This is a six-barrel rotating camera. This, the barrels rotate, and when the barrel comes up to the top, the gun fires. The uh, ammunition is 20 millimeter cannon shells. The whole shell is about that big. The bullet that put thins out is about that big, about three quarters of an inch in diameter, and it's explosive. It makes a big explosion. But what people don't understand is the rate of fire. 100 bullets per second. 100 bullets per second. Back in here, you carried 1,000 bullets. You had 10 seconds of fighting. <clears throat> but if you hit the other guy with a one second burst and you put 100 explosions, and explosions that big around inside his airplane, he's walking home. <laughs> if he's lucky. <laughs> if he's lucky. <laughs> Is it just the one on the airplane on Moss? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're, you're picking up on it. We used to call these King Airs. I don't know what they call them now. No, it's what you have self in the gas tank. But uh, if you get shot, I like through here, you get put a patch on it until it goes back to the next major overhaul. Okay, this is Beach Model 18, and I don't try to tell everybody all the different things it was. It was about 20 different airplanes during World War II. This airplane was built in Wichita, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And so for us, all of us here in Kansas, we can be really proud of this airplane. This airplane started out in 1942, and they built them for everybody. They built them for the Marines, they built them for the Army, they built them for the Navy, and anything you can do. Like you learn pilot training for, for big end, for, for bombers, that was the airplane. You learned to be a bombardier, that was the airplane. You learned to be a navigator, that was the airplane. Everything you learned in this airplane. Mm -hmm. the, Airplane, you'd think after World War II, 1945, okay, we stopped making airplanes, right? Because the war's over. No, because this airplane was so useful as a commercial or a civilian airplane that the market said, no, you got to keep making this airplane. Beach kept going for this, this airplane another 14 years until 1959 and built 9,000 of these, okay? There's still 2,000 of them flying all over the world. So if you go to the Caribbean, You'll find them down there. They'll take you and three or four of your buddies out on a fly fishing expedition on some little tiny island that nobody ever lives on. This is it. That's what you'll get into. A little airplane like this. Beach in Wichita actually is still sending manuals. They're, they're printing manuals for this airplane. Huh. Yeah. to tell students this about an airplane and I don't know that it'll, this will ever happen to you or not but if you see an airplane come taxiing in and if like your uncle or your grandpa or somebody don't run up to that airplane because that airplane is covered with static electricity and you know how when you comb your hair and then you take the comb and wow well think about a hundred times that bad okay because you got air damp air flowing over the surface of this aircraft, it makes static electricity. These are what get rid of most of it. Uh -huh. And at night, you fly, you follow this airplane at night, it's just like, 
little bit of it's just a flash is going constantly as the static electricity just comes right from here and discharge off those. But yeah, airplanes can gather great amounts of static electricity. What would it do to you if it if you got near it? Exactly. If, if you walked up to an airplane that hadn't been grounded, it would make your hair stand on end. <laughs> Quite a freak right now. And that'd be a pretty good job, wouldn't it? Are those some things like going water? This is a this is a very early uh mm -hmm. injection. Oh I'm sorry. That's a weasel. We use those in Vietnam. You hear that? They're oh, the weasel. Yeah. Amphibious means it's land and water. Yeah, I was going to get oh, you out, and we come out, I was going to get you out to the link train. Okay. Because we're going to talk a little bit about flying an airplane. Uh, but the weasel was used in Vietnam because uh, you can go in the water up to about three feet deep. And uh, see the big treads? Yeah. You, those treads are so wide you can go through mud and not sink into the mud. Whoa. And if you know anything about Vietnam, you know there were a lot of rice paddies. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of times what you need to do is cut right straight across that rice paddy to get to the end. That's what that's what those treads would do. Even if there was water in the in the rice paddy that deep, you just dove in and kept going. Uh, so the, what's called an amphibious vehicle. All right. Those are the intakes. Alley. This airplane is called the Boo, the F-101B. This airplane was made in St. Louis, Missouri. Two-man crew, pilot up front, radar interceptor, um, radar intercept officer in the back. This aircraft could fly at 1,280 miles an hour. This aircraft carried missiles. It was designed to stop enemy bombers from bringing nuclear bombs and dropping them on the United States. This aircraft had two conventional missiles. When I say conventional missiles, these are missiles that leave the airplane, go out, and strike another airplane with 40 pounds of explosion. And a 40 pounds of explosion is like two cases of dynamite. So that's pretty big. But it also carried a nuclear missile called a Genie. The Genie was designed to knock down entire squadrons of airplanes. And when the Genie went out, it could go to a squadron, the ball of fire was one mile of diameter. Anything inside that one mile of nuclear fire would simply disintegrate. So that's how, again, how formidable this airplane was. Uh, again, for, I think it was like 43 days, this was the most powerful and the fastest airplane in the world for like 43 days. And then a newer airplane came out that was even faster and more powerful. But, uh, Mm -hmm. we, during the 50s, we had airplanes coming out very, very rapidly. But this airplane, uh, again, had 35,000 horsepower. Uh, isn't that a beautiful sound? The jet airplane, guys. That's the prettiest sound in the world. <laughs> sound of freedom. Anyway, this airplane was one of the airplanes, when I was in the Air Force at, at headquarters ADC, I, we got one or two of these in every day coming in of what we call uh, uh, visitors, okay? Uh, and they came in because the headquarters, they had to come in and sign paperwork or whatever. This aircraft scared me because this aircraft has low intake and a very, very powerful engine. And so I would, every Saturday morning, I would have a briefing and I would say, guys, what's the one airplane that we most fear when we work on it? This was the airplane. So whenever the aircraft came in and parked, we immediately put pylons out in a very specific pattern <coughs> and said, if the engines are running, you do not go inside those pylons because if you do, there's a danger of being ingested into that intake. Uh, so again, it was just something that we had to keep watch of. This airplane weighs, when it was full of fuel, about 60,000 pounds. And in Colorado Springs, at 20 below, we freeze to the pavement. So to get the airplane moving, when it weighed 60,000 pounds and froze it to the pavement, you had to take the engines, both engines, and you would run the engines all the way up to maximum power to get the airplane broken free to be able to taxi out and take off. So there'd be a lot, like a vacuum cleaner, big old vacuum cleaner set in here. So that, that, that was the thing I worried about. That's what he means by intake, it comes in, it's coming into it. This airplane also had 
right above the star, it had a night light, very powerful. This airplane would come up on Russian airplanes because, see, during that time, during the late 60s, early 70s, the Russians were out there all the time. They were just off our coast. They were flying their airplanes in what's called international water. And you can't do anything to them, but they were there, and we knew there, so we would shadow them. And what the guys liked was that the Russians didn't have as much money as we did, and sometimes they didn't do good maintenance. And the Russians, their tail warning radar wouldn't tell them that this guy's sneaking up on them. So this guy would sneak up and come up on the right side of that airplane, get right even with the cockpit, say, on guard channel, hey, Boris, look, and then turn that light on. <laughs> You might as well have somebody put a flash camera right in your face. So Boris and all the other guys in that airplane wouldn't be able to have any night vision for about two days. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, um, they, kept, they kept the Russians on the toes. And we had, the Russians knew we knew where they were. And we, they knew we could shoot them down in a heartbeat. So all they did was just fly by us and threaten us. But they never threw a punch. Thank goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I have a but you see air pressure, a hole in the front, it's got holes in the side. And the pitot tube compares the air pressure in those two, the front and the side. And that's how you can compute your airspeed. Now, when you're landing an airplane, if you're going too slow, you'll never get to the runway. You'll crash. If you're going too fast, you'll never stop. You don't have enough brakes. So you have to land at exactly the right speed. This is what does that. So if you're ever around an airplane, don't take your chewing gum and put it in the end up here. <laughs> because you won't know how fast you're going in this aircraft. C this is like a, a fun, fun fact. C-47. Whenever you see the serial number on an Air Force airplane, that first number is the year it was made. You have to figure out the decade. Okay? So we know that this airplane was built between 1935 and 1945. So if you got a four, the only place you could go was 1944. This airplane is a 1944 purchase by the United States Air Force. That's a good year. It was, in all the airplanes that we bought in 1944, this was the 76,582nd airplane that we bought and paid for in World War II wow. in that year. Huh. And there were others with longer serial numbers, <laughs> wow. bigger numbers. Anyway, Boy, uh, this was, like I say, the DC-3, the C-47, call it whatever you want. This airplane has been flying and is still flying all over the world since 1935. There is a company that modernizes them in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. <laughs> and the guy who is modernizing these airplanes is telling the people that buy the airplanes I have set up my company to be in business until at least the year 2100. And we will get parts and we will have uh, manuals for you up until the year, at least the year 2100. That's 165 years out of an airplane. Wow. Okay? <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. 165 years. Yes, indeed. But it's in. Again. What, isn't, there a, isn't there a town down in the. Uh, uh, off of Highway 56, it's actually refitting these with uh, turbo props. Yeah, uh, and it's a salvage company too. I forget what they call it. Right. Uh, yeah. Right. I was. Well, I was going to tell you that that I was trying to fish them. When you when you refit one of these with turbo props, fair dinkum. If I'm lying, I'm dying. Because what they do most often is they lengthen the fuselage, so they put more cargo on. You got turbo props. You got a lot more horsepower. You get a lot more off the ground. I have heard, and I believe what I've heard, you can actually fly cargo cheaper than you can move it in an 18-wheeler. Hmm. Well, really? You can get it there a lot faster. Oh. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> but it's true. Get them off the road. That's true. This aircraft, just to give you an idea, every aircraft has to be inspected periodically. That inspection is very thorough to make sure that that aircraft is airworthy and safe. This aircraft is due an inspection. That inspection would cost us an awful lot of money. We could inspect this airplane and have the guys come down. It would take them about a week to do a really thorough inspection. 
And then we take off and go to Oshkosh or any place else that we wanted to go in that airplane because that airplane's in perfect shape. It's ready to fly right now. This airplane is ready to fly. Same thing. We just have to have to dis these aircraft need inspections. Mm -hmm. See what? Called yeah. swing wing. Wow. This wing is all the way back. And when you put it in the hangar, under the deck, the hangar deck of the carrier, you want the wing all the way back, made the airplane as small as possible. But when you flew the airplane, particularly on takeoff and landing, you wanted the wing all the way swung out forward. So it's straight out, just like that. As you got going faster, then you put the wing back to reduce drag, okay? So this wing can go all the way straight out, all the way back here. And it's all computer controlled. The airplane. This was used for Oh, yeah. Airplane has two fan jet, turbo fan jet engines. Instead of just plain jet engines, these are turbo fan. And they have afterburners. This aircraft has, again, on takeoff, about 50,000 horsepower. This aircraft flies at its maximum for a different couple of different reasons. Its maximum is 1,600 miles an hour. But the aircraft only goes that fast because of the cockpit. The glazing, the, the plastic that's used to make the cockpit cannot stand anything more than that because of the heat. The engines also overheat. But if you had a metal packed cockpit and you had cooling water to cool the engine. This airplane will fly 2,000 miles an hour. Okay? But they always held it to 1,600 because of the windshield. So. Oh, this, this airplane has hydraulic fluid, oil, this airplane. Is that a camera? It is indeed. That is called a folded optics camera. And I will tell you that on a clear day, you can see another airplane at 50 miles and know what kind of airplane it is. Wow. Now, here's the real thing. Airplanes cross each other, okay, in combat or whatever. Sometimes an airplane like this will go silent, turn off all the radars. Now you're just looking with your eyeballs, looking for the other guy. With that camera, I'm telling you the truth, with that camera, you're flying here in this airplane, the other guy's flying this way. If that guy goes like that, because he saw you, the camera will pick up his head movement and you'll say, he's seen us. Turn on all the radar, let's go kill him. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh... Tattoo You see that mask? Tattoo and set all if tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life. And I had to start again with just my children and my wife. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom and they can't take that away. American, where at least I know I'm free, and I won't forget the men who died, who gave that right to me, and I'd gladly stand up next to you, and defend her still today, cause there ain't no doubt I love this land, God bless the USA. From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston and New York to L.A., there's pride in every American heart and it's time we stand and say. 
I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the you